Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the OWHE webinar series. Um, today we're gonna hear about transforming into a learning organization from two awesome people from the University of Oregon. They'll give you a brief introduction about their presentation and who they are. Um, but first I wanted to share with you a couple of the upcoming opportunities we have at in Oregon Women in Higher Education. So I'm Sharice Bunn, and I'm actually the director of education here. And I was able to help um, put together the conference coming up in January. So we have a lot of different sessions coming up um, that go to different aspects, meaningful community, personal growth, professional growth and advancement, and systemic change and empowerment. The conference is January 25th and 26th in Sun River, Oregon. And I'd really encourage you to go. You're also able to watch um, the webinars we've had throughout 2007, they're all for free and they're available on our website. Um, and we will be having the 2018 webinar series put up uh, following the conference. So look for opportunities and emails coming up about that. With that, I'd actually like to turn it over to Anna and Heather. Hello, I'm Anna. <laughs> Hi, my name is Heather and we're really excited to be here with you all today. Um, we're screen sharing our um, presentation right now. It's a presentation with a PowerPoint with a lot of images. And so we're happy to share anything that we um, present today, whether it's our PowerPoint presentation or some articles or some of the resources. But we'll get started to share a little bit about ourselves. Um, and a shameless plug, Oregon Women in Higher Ed, if you have never been, it's quite an amazing experience. Um, and I actually have served on the board of directors before, and so it's a wonderful opportunity, and I'm planning to go this year, and just really excited about that opportunity. But I serve as the Associate Director of Residence Life here at the University of Oregon. Um, and I, again, I'm Anna, and I, Schmidt McKenzie, I am the Director of Residence Life and Educational Initiatives here at the University of Oregon. I have been here for slightly under three years. Um, and I think when I arrived at the U of O, we were part of the way into getting into being a learning organization and focused on um, learning for our residents and really having that be at the heart of what we do. Um, but we've also, I think, built a lot upon that and we have some ways to go. So we're really excited to share this journey with you. We did this presentation in person at the last OWHE. Uh, conference in January so hopefully we've adapted it a, a bit enough that you know we're not um, that it comes across in a webinar but it for some reason it doesn't translate as well our extreme apologies um, we did our best feel free to ask questions throughout the uh, the time we're with you today there are a lot of images and we, we talk through those images as opposed to lots of text so don't hesitate to get in touch with us or follow us on Instagram at our handles below. Um, with that, we will go ahead and get started. Um, so I love yoga um, and have been attending yoga and this is a photo of me in my most favorite position. Um, actually, I'm kidding, that is not me. That is a very difficult position to hold. Um, <laughs> This is actually my favorite position in yoga. Um, but if you've ever taken a yoga class, you know that at the very beginning of the class, uh, the instructor will generally ask people to talk about their intentions, um, why they're there today, why they're practicing, what they hope to get out of it. And so we hope that all of you have thought about and are considering your own intentions for being with us for the next Rough, roughly an hour um, of what you're hoping to get out. Feel free to ask questions if there's something we're not touching on. Um, what we are really hoping you will get out of us, our intention, is that you'll better understand how to create or lead your organization to focus on transformational learning, um, to get a firm understanding of why learning is so critical to the work we do. Also, why we rarely focus on it um, and how to maybe change your approach to better meet your institutional and organizational mission. Um, creating learning goals and outcomes for your students can sometimes feel like this esoteric, inaccessible goal. Um, and we're really hopeful that you'll find this presentation um, 
helpful in actually debunking that, making it energetic, fun, and practical so that you can take some information back and transform your organization into a really learning-centric environment. So our outcomes will be that you discover how to practically transform your work environment, whether that's an entire department or just a program within a department, into a really learning-centric organization aligned with your mission. Um, and that you'll be able to recognize how to easily assess development and learning of your students through experiences, programs, and processes. And while Heather and I are coming at this from a residence life and university housing perspective, um, please feel free to kind of adapt your own lens to the, from, from the function that you're coming from. So whether that's student activities or um, a recreation center or academic advising, we know that the OWHE participants are coming from a variety of lenses and perspectives and offices. So um, we may use some residence life examples because that's where we're situated, um, but hopefully they'll easily translate. And that is our intention for the time that we have with you today. Um, so I'll start by just kind of talking about environments. Um, I moved to Oregon from New York City uh, about, like I said, three years ago. And one of the things that I've really enjoyed about the Pacific Northwest uh, was, was camping. Uh, and usually I'd ask the question, like, how many people enjoy camping? So I'll ask you, but I don't know what your, your, uh, if you're nodding or not, but uh, I didn't know a thing about camping before I moved here. And since I've moved here, I've really enjoyed going out. Um, prior to that, I was really a big hotel person, um, enjoyed city, enjoyed urban life, still do. But I also really love camping. And one thing that I noticed um, a big difference is, might sound simple, but once you're out there camping, everything you have or don't have is what creates the environment for you. So it takes a lot of planning. I think the first time my partner and I went camping together, we spent about two weeks packing the car for a two day trip. Um, we thought about everything that we wanted because there was no concierge to call. Um, there was not a Walgreens on any corner that we could just go to. Um, so really you were, uh, for better or for worse, stuck with the things that you had thought about and planned to bring. Um, and when we got there, luckily, because we'd spent two weeks, we realized, um, you know, we did a pretty good job and it contributed to an amazing experience and a, a wonderful environment. Um, but if we, we hadn't thought and planned and been intentional about that um, for that time ahead of time, we could have gone uh, sideways. So, the kind of bottom line metaphor that I took from this is like you really contribute and create the environment for success, similar to, uh, to camping. So what we focus on here is just uh, the success being learning and being at the heart of everything that we do here. Um, so how do we do that? How do we plan? How do we create the right conditions? Um, we'll get into that kind of next um, with some theoretical foundations. Um, I love this quote. This is a professor from San Diego State University um, just talking about the importance, the critical importance of learning and the learning environment in the work that we're doing. Um, she says, if we toss out our commitment to intentionally designing and evaluating all systems, as they relate to the facilitation of holistic student learning and development, we've lost the very essence of why our profession was created in the first place. So if we can't articulate why what we do advances the wholeness of the human experience education, then what exactly is our purpose and how will assessment inform that conversation? Um, and I just, I love that quote as sort of a foundation because it really brings back to um, I think just the essence of why I do the work that I do and why I think student affairs does the work that it does um, is to contribute to this overall learning experience. Um, and it's, it can be very easy to jump into very transactional experiences. There's a certain commodification of education right now where students are expecting certain um, outcomes 
that may or may not align with an educational mission or your institutional mission. And so I think really having that conversation with your department about why you're here, seeing yourself as an educator, how you contribute to that overall learning environment, how you complement the classroom or augment the classroom experiences um, is just critical for our success um, uh, as, as our own industry, um, but as your sort of personal or your professional organization um, and the work that you're doing. So, you know, this is work that is at David Cole has been doing this work for decades. John Dewey, Alexander Aston, George Q, Carney Strange, Sylvia Hurtado. Um, they all, you know, they're um, really uh, the forefront researchers in our field and talk about the process of learning and the environment where it's designed. It's not just happenstance, that all of this really, really matters. Um, and if you, you know, we'll give you some resources, but if you want to look at AACU Great Expectations, the ACPA Learning Imperative, what was super helpful for us was learning, looking at Learning Reconsidered 1 and 2, um, and some articles that we'll share with you at the very end of this presentation, but just rooting yourself and rooting your department in kind of foundational why questions, why learning is so important. Um, the second uh, kind of foundational why, um, why learning is so important is that it's not just contributing to what students are experiencing in the here and now, right, on our campuses. Um, we're in an age of accountability, you know, in, at an increasing rate of what are our graduates um, graduating with, what are the skills that they're bringing with them, what are they learning while they're here, how is that not just making a great experience during their um, four or five years on our campuses or however much time they're with us, but what are they really taking with them when they graduate um, on to their careers, to their lives, to um, successful members of, of a society. Um, and some of the numbers are a little discouraging right now when we look at Gallup polls talking about 13% of the world's workforce, 32% um, of the U.S. workforce actually find meaning in what they do, um, that they're changing jobs very frequently. Um, you know, that's a, it's a changing world, so they're needing more and more skills and learning more learning more competencies. The um, AACU uh, and, and, and NACE um, talk about the, the skills that employers are looking for are very transferable. So it's not just what's happening in the classroom, but what's happening outside of the classroom. Um, and 71 to 83%, so the vast majority of employers are only hiring college graduates with meaningful experiences. So we want our students not only to um, learn from us, be, be able to articulate what those are. Um, and so I think we're in a perfect position as student affairs administrators to help them make meaning of what they're learning in the residence halls, what they're learning in student activities, student government, what they're learning in their, um, on the sports fields, and really connecting that clearly to experiences and learning and skills and what they can take with them to the next um, to their, you know, their future careers and their lives. Um, so that's kind of setting a little bit of foundation of, of why this is so important. I'm going to turn it to Heather to talk about kind of where, where we were and we'll then move into kind of where we're going with our own organization, getting back to sort of the practical, how do you move the needle. Yeah. So my name is Heather and I started at the University of Oregon in 2011 and like Anna said at the beginning, she started here at the U of O in 2015. So I wanted to share the context of kind of um, how our department was siloed in nature um, with our previous learning areas is what we called them and also talking a little bit about that process and kind of the shift in leadership ideally, whether it's at the institution or within our department, I think um, that kind of for context is what kind of catapulted us forward to create these learning goals and learning outcomes for our department. And so um, when I started in 2011, we had a brand new director who came and the Division of Student Affairs at the time was charged, um, all the departments were charged to create learning goals or to create learning areas within our department. And so uh, we talked a lot about how do we want our students to learn within residence halls? What does this look like? Our structure at the time, we had um, 
five assistant directors. And so we went through a process called appreciative inquiry, which is a really amazing um, process to kind of look a little bit about what you want your department, what you want your students to learn. You kind of discover, like look a little bit about what you want them to engage in. You dream about what the opportunities are. Um, it's like a four stage process and it's um, a good opportunity for people who have been in organizations for a while when you want them to continue to change and to, con to continue to evolve. So appreciative inquiry is what kind of the department went through within that time frame and we ended up having five um, learning areas and so every assistant director took one of those learning areas and infused that within our department so for instance i was an assistant director at the time and my learning area was leadership and community engagement and so i worked with our with a few of our professional staff members along with some of our students and we created different in services for resident assistants we created different opportunities for our residents um, around leadership and community but it was very siloed in nature um, and so we, it was rooted in student development student development theory um, the learning goals that we had we hadn't yet done the work to translate that into student language so we couldn't really share that with students of this is what we want you to engage in and learn because our department at the time didn't hadn't done that work yet so it was very kind of academic in nature and very um, focused where our professional staff understood what we were trying to teach students but then yet um, when we're explaining it to students, it wasn't necessarily translated in that language yet. So there's still some things that we could have done moving forward. And then, and at that time, it, it worked within our structure in some ways. And so when Anna had arrived in 2015, we had a shift within our division. We had a shift within our department. And in Anna's vision, we hired her to kind of create these this learning-centric um, organization and that's I was on her hiring committee so loved love Anna love that she's here um, but really learned a lot from Anna about what does it mean to have learning at the whole core of what you do and so when Anna arrived um, there was a group of us that got together and created these kind of three half day summits for our department and the goals for those would really be to focus on the institutional mission look at our divisional and our department mission and kind of distill down to what we want our department to do and there was a lot of turnover the structure didn't work to have learning goals anymore um, and so we focused a lot of our energy into create learning um, to create learning goals that made sense within our division um, and they were easy translated for students to understand where where that was so that's kind of the history i think context sometimes matters and i think as you think about creating more of a learning centric department it's really important to understand how do you navigate that within your systems and within your um, department and the staff that you have and, and how do you best support people who might be there for a while who might be invested in maybe the goals that are currently already there and how do you reevaluate that and so i think it's really important to understand and be intentional about how are you going to shift things when um, there's new staff and, and that's important to understand and i think how we did that was very methodical of getting a small group together um, to do that and we're going to explain a little bit about our process that we went through two years ago now um, mm -hmm. to create our learning goals yeah so i if you can see on the next slide just kind of the road we took um, and the first two lines are bolded so i'm going to focus on these um, i will say we are at uh four we've done four of these six uh, parts of the process. So we're still in process and I, I guess I say that to give people hope that um, It doesn't have to happen by the end of a term. It can't I think generally happen um, Overnight, so while it, it is a process it's practical it can be exciting and fun and accessible. It does take time um, If you want to do it right and so if we're honest um, you know, we've had setbacks and practical setbacks of, uh, of priorities that have come up and and put us on pause for moments, but we're very committed to going through the, the fullness of this process. We're just at, you know, if I look at these six bullets, um, I guess there's actually no bullet points, but these six <laughs> lines um, that we're really at the end of four. So I'm going to focus on the first two um, and then turn it back to Heather to talk about the, the next two. Um, and the first thing, like with any process, is really having your full department understand why learning is so important. Um, 
And so we'll, we'll go through the agendas in a little bit, but we really engaged in some readings for our staff. We went that small group, uh, researched a particular articles, other resources that we thought would be super helpful um, to have folks understand why learning is so important. A really, you, you may have uh, likely read Learning Reconsidered too. I know it's, it's kind of an oldie but a goodie at this point, but it really is helpful in understanding why learning is so important and how it can be mapped um, onto the work that you do. Um, and then the next thing we did, and I kind of briefly, I guess, talked about this at the beginning of our own presentation as a model of why learning is really important. Um, the second part of the process was understanding what a learning goal is, what a learning outcome is, and how to actually write them. And so we spent time um, kind of writing out learning goals and writing out learning outcomes and understanding the difference between those um, with our whole team. So that's kind of an overview. Um, this is a, an example, I think if I'm giving you all a mini tutorial of the difference between what a learning goal is, um, something you're hoping to achieve, different from what a learning outcome is, um, what you're hoping to actually see and measure at the end of the day, um, there's a difference and, and it can be confusing for people. And so the way I like to best describe it is sort of the difference when you think back to an election, um, the goal for a candidate um, is to, to win an election, right? So this might make more sense because we were doing this presentation last January um, when we were in a pretty big election, but each candidate really wanted to win. It wasn't necessarily a measurable thing, but the goal was to win uh, the, um, the election, right? So that can be considered a goal. An um, outcome is when you think about measuring the number of electoral votes it takes to win that that election. So that's something that you can actually drill down and say specifically um, what, you know, what number of votes need to be in place in order for you to reach your goal, if that makes sense. So that's sort of a mini uh, tutorial of, of what a learning goal is um, versus a learning outcome. Um, some tools we further used in our, in our discussion um, Sorry, briefly, I'll get back to that one. Um, you may have seen these SMART goals, and these are actually what I would consider more outcomes versus goals. Um, so, you know, outcomes need to be very specific. Um, you need this many votes, which is, is measurable. Um, they're actually attainable. Um, you know, this is our strategies to actually get those particular votes if I'm using the election again as a, a model um, that is relevant to everyone, you know, wanting to win an election is obviously relevant at that time and, and even just recently. Um, and there's a time base to this. And so when you're thinking about, um, when you're talking about outcomes that you want for your department, you want these to, we, we want to be able to say, you know, it's just not an indefinite thing that's out there that sits on a piece of paper, but we have a plan, we have a, um, a lot of people call it like sort of an assessment cycle or an assessment plan of figuring out what it is we want to measure um, and what it is uh, when we want to do that and people who are responsible for that. So that's all kind of part of the planning of learning outcomes um, and goals. And I guess, no. okay, uh, another tool that we used um, was Bloom's taxonomy. So when we were actually writing out our learning outcomes, and I'll show you an example of one, but when we were doing our learning goals and outcomes, we really wanted to show that, you know, outcomes are things that you can measure and observe. And so if you look at, this is Bloom's taxonomy, which teachers use often to uh, figure out learning outcomes for their classes when they're making assignments and things like that, and different levels of, of learning. So if you just want your students to remember things, um, when you're writing outcomes, you're gonna use words like, you know, students can describe, or they can memorize, or they can define something. 
Um, we use this in like when we're, create, we're writing policy or we're sharing policies for our students who live in the residence halls. We want people to be able to describe them. That tells us that they actually learned the information. Um, as opposed to being able to understand it, which might mean they can interpret it, they can summarize it. So if we have a student who, let's say, breaks one of those policies, um, and then we have a conversation with them about breaking a policy, let's say it's a noise violation, something that happens on a routine basis here. Um, when you sit down and have a conversation with them about that noise violation, they can kind of summarize, they can tell, they can describe the policy, they can summarize what that means, interpret what that means in their, on their residence hall floor. Um, and, you know, that to me suggests that they understand it, that you've actually hit learning with those students. Um, that's very different from actually applying it and using a policy for the future. Um, but you can kind of see where I'm going with this when you're writing outcomes for a particular level of learning and you're thinking about the programs and strategies that you're employing in your context, writing out, using Bloom's taxonomy is a great tool to help you understand sort of how you're gonna measure that, um, how you're gonna make it very specific. And then it also will lend you um, the great sort of insight into assessing and, and how you want to assess that. Um, turn over to Heather to maybe add on to that a little yeah, bit. I guess the other thing, um, Bloom's taxonomy changes often, and so this is kind of like the newest image that you can see. So as you see, the remembering is more of a basic level, and as you move up Bloom's taxonomy, it just becomes more critical thinking. And so knowing what you want people to learn and really understanding what you want them to do is going to be helpful when you create very strategic um, action verbs um, with your learning outcomes. It's going to be helpful. So then you can also flip the learning outcomes and think about how are you teaching people? How are you educating? How are you doing trainings? How are you talking to people about them? So it's going to be really helpful um, and imperative to have the right verbs that you're using. Um, and then moving forward, we had one of our learning goals that you can see. So not an outcome, but a goal is community. And so this kind of shows the process of us moving forward to a goal that we really want residents to invest um, we want them to invest in the relationships that they have. We want them to make um, positive actions and maintain an inclusive um, and dynamic community. And so this is a goal that we have. And so underneath our goals, we have five learning goals. And underneath them, they have more specific measurable outcomes. But the goals are pretty set and standard, but our outcomes are something that as Anna said at the beginning, we're very much of a learning organization and still kind of fluid in our process of maybe we're going to look at our outcomes to see if they're relevant and where, where we're reaching. And so I think our goals are set, but our outcomes could be more um, changeable as the, as the students change and, and all those things. So I think we're evaluating that as we go. And then moving forward, um, Anna described the first kind of two bullet points in the process, and I'll describe the next two. And this is kind of where um, we are at, at in our organization. So like I said, we had a three um, half day summits. And I think if you work in any type of organization, the goal of what you have planned out for those three, you know, half day summits are not necessarily where we ended up. So we'll share with you the agendas that we had um, and let you know where we kind of ended up within those things. Um, and Anna said we did a lot with Learning Reconsider too. We had some pre-work for people. We had different articles that we wrote, that we read. Um, we looked at CAS standards. We um, looked at a QOI, which is our professional home and the standards that they have for um, residence life programs. Um, we looked at our University of Oregon mission within our division that we were in at the time. Um, and residence life here at the U of O is housed within university housing. And so we kind of looked at all of the information. So what is it that um, our what, what is it that our institution wants students to learn? What is it that our department wants students to learn students to learn? What is it that um, you know the standards and, and researchers say that students should be learning. Um, and then also, Anna asked REs, what, what do our residents learn within, within housing when they live with us? What, do you, what, 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 do you, what would you say they learned? And so we had all of that information before we went into um, our three-day summits. And so to kind of show you a brief 
overview of them. Um, I'm happy to send you the agendas, so feel free to email me. I can send them on over to you, but we had three half-day summits, and so the first summit we had some pre-meeting. We talked a lot about mission, goals, um, talked about learning goals, learning outcomes, and kind of the overview of our time together, and we had these summits about two to three weeks apart from each other, so the process um, if you were doing this, if you were following this, it would probably take about um, a month and a half to two months to kind of manage that. And it was enough kind of work in between the summits for our team um, that seemed manageable for us as we moved forward. A lot of our work was in small groups. So we had small round tables and we had facilitators at each table. Um, and we talked a lot about learning goals um, and how do students learn and we practice writing outcomes um, before we got into our specific kind of res life outcomes that we had. Um, and the first session was really a lot about um, just the theoretical groundwork. Um, our summit two was focusing more on our external um, and internal documents of what our um, division, our departments and, and our institution says that we should do and also looking at what resident assistants who are at the ground level working with our students and living in the residence halls, what do they say that students learn when they live with us? Um, and looking at standards within our um, within our housing area, within the professional um, associations, within um, higher education. And so we kind of took this really big kind of like just like a very big like brain dump of, of what do we want our students to learn living with us. And so um, from that standpoint, we did a, a distilling activity and came down to our five learning goals that we have. And so there's a lot of kind of conversation about how do how, how should things be worded and what do we um, want students to learn. Um, and I think there's still a lot of good work that we have to move forward and, and kind of understanding how do students learn. Um, in our summit three, we were going to kind of manage different strategies that we had, but our summit three was really spent mostly on the wording of our learning goals, learning outcomes. Um, yeah, I would say if you've ever been a part of a wordsmithing yes. group, um, it's surprising uh, or maybe not surprising to you of how uh, invested people are in particular words. Um, I think by the end, some people are like, I don't care what it says, um, you know, as long as the concept is there, but you know, depending on the size of your group and how you come together, I would expect this part of the process to give it, you know, we learn to give it a little more time because if it's important to people, they should be invested in it. And what you say are your goals are important. And so, you know, should you say the versus a and things like that take a lot of time, at least with the size of our group, we had almost 30 people in the room. Um, and so it, it took a lot more time, which I think were one of the lessons learned. I think, and I think something also, if you were going to apply this, there was a core group of like five or six of us that were planning these sessions. And so those were the people that were leading the small groups. And so I think if I had to do this all over again, I would probably use that group as like the um, sounding board. So we're going to take this back and wordsmith this and present this back to you rather than having 30 people's voices a part of it. And so that's something that I learned just as a facilitator. Of how do you um, streamline things to make it more manageable for people and people that are invested in the process? Not saying that other people weren't invested in the process, but um, I think it could have made the process move forward in a different way to actually have us go through all of our um, things that we wanted people to manage in the summit, but that's where we um, ended. So. Absolutely. Um, so usually in a presentation, I'm like, are there any questions right now? But we'll wait till the very, very end. Um, so we'll keep moving on. Uh, an activity that we um, did that I think would be helpful for you um, if you're gonna do this in a practical way is thinking about not just like what you want your students to learn sort of in these strategies that you employ in your department um, and that context, but what do you really think an ideal graduate um, should be able to know um, or, you know, or do as a result of engaging with your program or with your college? And so we had this brainstorm activity where people would have a whole pad of yellow sticky notes and they really, you know, everything from learning about um, dealing with difference to um, writing skills. I mean, it really um, ran the gamut, um, but 
when you think about your organization, I think a, a one activity that's super helpful is to think about what is the ideal program participant? Um, what would they learn from their experience? If you tripped over them, what would they look like? Um, and so, and then getting into groups or five of six or six people, put all those notes on a wall service, wall service surface, excuse me, and start to cluster them into categories. That can also be a helpful way of thinking about those bigger overarching learning goals. Um, you know, we, we spent a lot of time looking at a lot of external and internal data, but I also think a good way of engaging your staff and um, people in your organization is to you know, just have people brain dump kind of what they imagine the ideal graduate would have. Um, and then building those learning goals uh, through those particular themes. Um, you know, and then mapping those out onto actually what you do or what what do you do specifically that contributes to that particular uh, learning goal. I think one thing that can happen and um, we see is these goals can be so broad um, that they could almost be anything, right? Um, when I think about the five, we showed you community as one of our goals. Our others are responsibility, um, identity development and cultural awareness, academic success, um, and responsibility at, in addition to the community. So it's, you know, those are pretty broad. And what we tried to really think about is all, all of those things connected to the resident's life experience. And I would challenge you to ask that for yourself. Are all of our goals um, and things that we want our graduates to know related to the work that we do? That a staff member sort of equate it to, are we more like a Costco where we're teaching everybody everything? Or are we more like a boutique store where you're coming in and gaining particular experiences in a particular area? And it's a great question, I think, for us in residence life and housing. Um, I don't know that I'd say we're like Costco and we do everything for everyone, um, but we're maybe more like a Target than a small boutique, right? So um, it's just helpful to know kind of what is the scope and scale of learning that happens in your context, in your department, and keeping it there as opposed to these are, you know, as much as we're talking about the ideal graduate, we're also talking about how are they learning that in your context, if that makes sense. Okay. And then kind of where we're going, I mentioned we're not there yet. Um, we're still on this road and um, the next kind of piece that we really want to look at is mapping our particular strategies. So that is what we do, everything that we do, um, mapping that onto um, our learning goals. Because I will often say if we are doing something, you know, we're actually employing a particular strategy, it should be going towards a goal. And if we are doing things that sit outside of those learning goals, one, why are we doing them? Do we, should we cut them? Um, or they, should they be done by someone else? What is the rationale for doing things? Um, because not actually doing strategies that meet your learning goals will be the first step to, to take you away from being an actually learning-centric organization. Um, it's not to say there's not sometimes tasks, operational things that um, fall on people's plates and they're super important, but I just, in kind of sticking to what we need to do um, and why we need to do it, it really should be mapped onto learning goals. Um, so, you know, we hire a lot of RAs. Um, why do we do that? Um, well, it's very much connected to community and creating a sense of responsibility. Um, a lot of what our RAs do in their one-on-one -on -one conversations with our residents or the community events that they're having is talking about academic planning. Um, they're talking about responsibility to the entirety of the community. I can map all of those things that our RAs do back to our particular learning goals. Um, similar for our conduct process, I mentioned the policies that we have in place and holding students accountable for those policies. We don't just do that arbitrarily, we do that because students are learning what it means to be an individual on and have individual behavior and decisions and what that means as far as uh, its impact on others and impact on community members. So um, again, it, you know, we don't, we want 
our, our staff to see themselves as educators and to understand that we don't just do these things for the sake of doing them, but we do them because we want our residents to learn to be responsible, responsible community members, um, if that makes sense. So strategy mapping is something that um, we're going to focus in on this year. Um, and then the last piece is just measuring an ass and assessment of those of those learning goals um, and excuse me those learning outcomes and so specific to different strategies we want to make sure that those outcomes are actually written in a way that we can observe them inside of particular uh, strategies or contexts and not just sort of free floating we want to connect them to the things we do right um, and then as they're written, they really should be lending themselves to how we actually assess those things. So at the end of the day, we want to be able to say, here's our overarching goals. Here's how we go about meeting them. Here's the specific measurable outcomes for each of those strategies. And here's how we are, um, here's how successful we were and how, how we know that students actually learned these things. So uh, those last two pieces are still like in the works. And I know I usually would say an assessment, you know, when you think about assessment cycle, it starts, uh, you should start thinking about what you want to assess. And I don't think we've not done that. It's more a matter of, you know, thinking about goals as a part of your assessment. And then at the end, actually measuring whether or not you've done that. So um, that's where we are in our particular journey um, in uh, transforming our organization. I'll let Heather go through kind of our Resources. Yeah, these are just some of the resources that we utilized. You'll see an article in 2017. It's not something we utilized a year and a half ago, but it's a very more, it's, it's relevant if you're looking for some articles that are um, helpful to kind of talk about learning beyond the classroom. I think oftentimes when we talk about curriculum or curricular type of environments, um, there's usually two silos within a university, obviously academic and then the student affairs type of things, but ideally a lot of the articles that we have listed here kind of show the ability for student affairs practitioners to be educators outside of the classroom. And so we found these to be really very helpful for our department to um, just invest in the ability to want to encourage students to, to learn and really be able to see ourselves as educators. And oftentimes I think um, when you work at such a large institution, it feels very removed to doing that. But I think everything we do is rooted in education and those educational moments matter. And so um, I really get excited about the learning uh, goals that we have because I think there's so much validity in, in talking about what does it mean to be responsible and what is community and how, how has that student been impacted in, in the community or have, have impacted others. And maybe that's in a conduct meeting, but I think we have a really great advantage of being able to talk about our goals and having our staff be able to implement that and being intentional when they talk to people um, about that. And so those are some of the articles that we've utilized. Um, also, Anna and I um, have the ability to go to the Residential Curriculum Institute, which is very focused on um, residents, life staff, or housing staff, and how to build a curriculum um, that's rooted in goals and, and outcomes. And so, like I said, a lot of that work, and like Anna said, is, is we're continuing to do that. And so we talked a lot about best practices and looked at AACNU, the CAS standards, as well as looked at a um, And there's a lot of great resources within NASPA and ECPA. And Learning Reconsidered, too, is something that we focused a lot of our work on. Um, and shamelessly, if you'd like to see our um, learning some agendas, I'm happy to send those to you as well as all of the things that are listed on there. I'd be happy to send those to you. We have them in documents. Um, one of the one of the activities we also did at our um, session in January was um, a self assessment of being able to map out your own journey of where your department is. And so we'll have some. Um, on the next screen, I have it in a Word document, but wanting you to just look at this and think a little bit about where you are. So we're going to give you some, we want to just jot down some time. I think we gave participants about five minutes to do that. I won't do that here. Um, but just look at some of these questions of um, where do you, where are you? Do you strongly agree that you see yourself as an educator um, and why or why not? And so just take some time to think about this um, and we'll give you a minute or two and we're, we're going to mute ourselves.
All right, so um, at this stage, um, we would probably put you in dyad to talk a little bit about where you are. Um, and I think a lot of what we heard when we facilitated this in January were um, people um, might see themselves in, as an educator, but have lacked the ability to understand how being an educator connects to the goals that they have or like the university's mission. And so I think it's really important when you see yourself as an educator or know that you are an educator and being able to see and distill from the university's mission down to like your learning goals within your department and how do you live that out on a day-to-day -day basis and it's so vital and so important to be tied back to the university's mission and so I, I hope that this kind of self-assessment kind of learning in your organization is helpful for you to understand where you're at and it's it's fine to strongly disagree and it's finally to strongly agree but being intentional and knowing where those growing areas are for you and your department is going to be very helpful as far as how you talk about things and so um, I think oftentimes Anna and I work in the central staff team and it's very important for us to talk about learning and it's very important for us to talk about our learning goals because if we're not modeling that for our staff and our team then they're not going to model that for the students that they work with and so I think it's really vital um, whatever position that you have that you're continuously thinking about the goals that are in your department and or if they're not goals that are there like how do you how do you manage that and how do you talk about the mission of your institution to kind of relate it back to to what you do on a day-to-day -day basis and so this was kind of adapted from the residential curriculum institute and we have that and um, we're happy to share that with you so yeah and i even i will say even in doing some continual assessment of where we're at here um, at the u of o heather and i were both at a meeting on monday evening with students who were talking about how the learning goals were showing up in their events and their programs in in their residence halls and i think we were imagining it as being sort of these overarching goals that were infused into all of the work that we were doing and how we were hearing it described by some of our students was a little alarming because it was turning into like check boxes of i've done this type of program or i've done this type of event that focuses on one particular learning goal and so i think we i'm trying to figure out how do we go back and say no this is an infusion into everything that we do and, and one-off conversations are okay and the conduct meetings are a part of this and it's not just all events and programs so um, we're learning about what we need to do as well um one last activity i will have we wanted you all to do if this is working Hello. um is i was very inspired by a, a book uh called essentialism um jeff mccow i i highly recommend you go onto amazon it actually doesn't cost very much money um so I would buy this book. It talks about the essential things that you do and why you do them um, and kind of how to get back to the essence of what you do. And um, I, I was very inspired by this when I think about learning, because as I mentioned at the beginning, it truly in my heart is the essence of what we do and why we should be doing it and eliminating some of the noise and the chaos and this is kind of from the cover of the book or from the book of this mess of jumbly of all these things that you do. Um, transforming that into this is the thing that we do and we focus on and so for us um, that's constantly trying to build that to that learning centric organization um, but this means that you have to prioritize things <laughs> so I'm going to take you through a quick activity hopefully you've had some things you've been thinking about over the past um, 45 minutes to 50 minutes that we've been on this webinar and I just want you to write down um, three things that you think you would do based on your self-assessment or something you've learned. So I'll just give you a minute to write down three things that you need to do. Okay, you got them? Hopefully, yes. <laughs> um, and when you look at those things, maybe it's setting up a meeting, maybe it's talking to somebody. Um, if you can just prioritize those into your number one, number two, number three. So if they weren't prioritized before, please prioritize them one, two, and three. 
Now I just want you to X out number two and X out number three. So you should be left with one thing that you need to do, but it, if it's broad, I, now I want you to write maybe under that an A, B, C, sort of what do you need to have accomplished that? Maybe it's actually setting up the meeting or reading an article or what, whatever it is. So do A, B, and C. And I want you to now cross out uh, or prioritize those into one, two, three, your ABC, and cross out the B and the C. So I need you to have, here's one thing I want to do, and then the one thing I need to do start to have that happen. Um, and that is kind of a first step in figuring out priorities one thing this book really resonated with me is, is if everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. And I think too often in this work, in student affairs, you have this like long to-do list and a thousand things that you need to do to get them done. And everything feels like it's a priority. And it's a really good practice for ourselves to look at those things. Not that you'll never get to number two or number three on your to-do list, or you'll not get to the B and the C, but you're never going to get there if you can't prioritize it um, and say what is essential. And so for us, you know, it's we haven't been perfect at this, absolutely not. Um, but I think we are really committed to continuing on this journey of transforming our organization. I hope that this small seminar was helpful in kind of understanding some of the practical ways we've started that journey. Um, that you can do it. Heather and I are both happy to be resources, share everything that we have done, um, continue to answer questions if this resonates with you. Um, and I think we'll, that is it as far as our content. Um, so if there's questions, raise your hand. Uh, I'm going to turn it back, I think, to Sharice, who's our host, to facilitate questions if there are any because um, I'm not a mechanical person when it comes to the technology on this. So I'll turn that back over to you if that's okay, Sharice. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Anna and Heather. That was a great webinar. I'm so excited to be able to share this with some colleagues and think about what we do in our organization as well. Um, so I put in, type any questions here. Does anybody have any questions to ask? Well, if not, it looks like there aren't any questions. So I think we're actually gonna um, call it, oh, 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 hold on, I've got one. Are you ready? <laughs> yep. Okay, did you get resistance from team members when you first launched this initiative? If so, how did you respond? Yeah, um, this is Heather and I, I think we did. And that's why I kind of shared a little bit about the context of where, um, where we're going. And I think that, you know, for, for us, when we were thinking about how do we create this, we ended up strategically picking about six different people within our organization at different levels of the organization to um, create these kind of agendas. And so we had buy-in at all different levels of where we were going. I think sometimes some of the staff that were there um, communicated, well, I've done this, you know, 10 or 15 times at other departments that I've been in. And, and I and I my response to that was yes, and we're going to continue to do it because it's really important to learn, and it's also an ability when a new director comes in to have a vision for them to set the stage for our department. And so I think it was strategic conversations for at least my side of things um, of being able to talk with people prior to set the stage on knowing um, knowing where people were coming from and being able to talk a little bit about how we were going to engage. We also had expectations. We clearly communicated prior to what we wanted people to um, gain and how we wanted people to show up. And so ideally, like, I think we, we had some of that resistance, but I do believe that we opened it up enough that people were a part of the process that it, they felt invested in, in the process. Um, the only other piece of resistance I think I would say is if you're leading this charge, um, that was, I felt like a mea culpa on my part, was um, not kind of understanding 
how the former iteration of those learning areas, Heather talked about, the silos, um, how connected there were staff were to those particular areas and how um, I didn't necessarily see their professional identity connected to a learning area. It hadn't been, ex I, I just, I didn't understand that. Um, and maybe I didn't put enough work into understanding that identity. But when we were saying, you know, we're going to blow up the silos and really make this about how we do our overall work. Um, it was hard for some of our assistant directors, I think in particular, who um, were you know, attached to that idea of this is my area, this is my lane, and I, not a control thing, but just a really a passion for that. And so um, that was a, a little bit of the resistance that if I could go back in time, I would probably um, better understand how that would hit and land, and that might have changed the way we, we talked about it. Great. Well, I wanted to thank you once, once again. Um, I asked if there are more questions. So if nobody asks anymore, I think we're going to call this good. This webinar will be available on the website. So um, you can share it and I will send out um, an email to all who registered and those of you who attended so you can um, watch it and share it with other people. So thanks so much, Anna and Heather. Thank you all for signing up and listening. We let, let us know if we can help further.